Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. My name is Brooke Christensen, and I'm a PhD student in the Daily Lab at the University of California, Irvine. I'm happy to welcome you to another in a series of workshops on integrative organismal modeling of movement. These workshops have been sponsored by the NSF Division of Organismal Systems, with the overarching goal of bringing together scientists across disciplines at the intersection of organismal biology and physics. These workshops are all recorded and shared online as a open access resource hosted through the UCI Center for Integrative Movement Sciences with the School of Biological Sciences. And with that, thank you all very much for your attention and please welcome today's workshop speakers, Dr. Angela Horner and Dr. Jeff Olberding. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. And um, thank you to the organizers of this workshop series for uh, inviting us here to talk to you today. Um, and thank you to Drs. Porter and Sloboda for the first part of this workshop series um, a couple weeks ago. So um, what we thought we'd, we would present today is discussing some of the practical challenges or um, considerations of measuring material properties in biological tissues, um, and then give an example of some of the ways to work around those considerations or solve some of those challenges. And so I'm gonna to start today with sort of a general overview and then about halfway through Dr. Horner will take over and talk about a specific example of uh, some experiments that she's done and how she's approached some of the difficulties of working with uh, soft tissues. So to start off with um, a soft tissue would be defined by having the tendency to deform or be structurally altered when you apply mechanical stresses to it, um, as opposed to a harder um, tissue or a harder material um, that wouldn't have much deformation before you see uh, things like fracture occurring. So by definition, if you're interested in studying the material properties of these tissues or soft materials, you need to be able to observe simultaneous changes in both force and length or displacement. Um, which are expressed respectively as stress or force normalized to cross-sectional area or strain, which is displacement normalized to um, a starting length. And by uh, making those measurements, you can uh, determine a number of different material properties. So for example, in a soft material, you may see an elastic region um, where deformation is reversible, um, but at some point, uh, you apply a high enough stress, you reach a yield point where the following deformation is plastic, it's not reversible, and you're observing um, structural changes to the material itself until eventually you reach a high enough stress that um, you see fracture or destruction of the material. Um, so depending on what you're looking at, this uh, relationship between stress and strain may look different. You may be interested in different material properties, but ultimately you need to have some way of uh, controlling and measuring changes in force and length. And this can be very low tech. Um, you can imagine uh, simply putting a weight on top of a tissue sample and observing how much it's compressed by that weight uh, under the force of gravity. Um, or you can imagine taking a spring scale and pulling on um, one end of a sample with it and measuring the change in length while observing the, the force on the spring scale. Um, but usually we want some some better resolution um, in those measurements and a little bit more control. And there's a number of different pieces of technology that we can use um, to help with making these measurements. Um, probably the simplest end of, in terms of instrumentation is uh, coupling a linear force transducer with some sort of motor, which could even just be you know, a, a hand powered crank type situation. And the advantages of this type of uh, setup are that you, it's relatively inexpensive, and you have a lot of power to customize that setup to your particular experiment, right? So you can um, control the way that uh, force is being applied to a sample um, uh, <clears throat> by controlling very specifically what is the motor uh, and what is the force transducer that's uh, being used to make a measurement. Um, some of the disadvantages is that uh, when you create one of these setups um, and you're coupling together a motor and force transducer, whatever you create there is going to be very specific to the, the current test that you're doing and probably 
um, not something that you're going to reuse uh, for future experiments or, or different samples or different types of materials or tissues, I should say. Um, and when you're using a linear force transducer uh, and a motor, you have to be careful about um, ensuring that you're operating within sort of a single dimension of linear movement while making these measurements, which can be a little bit tricky to do. Um, if you are in a biology department where you have um, a muscle physiologist, you may have a dual mode servo motor sitting around. These are commonly called muscle levers. Uh, and they have the advantage of simultaneously controlling and measuring uh, force and changes in length. Um, so it's a convenient setup where you can attach a sample and program the, the servo motor to displace and uh, immediately read the force output. Um, some of the disadvantages are that this type of um, instrument is relatively expensive um, and you just have to be lucky that someone has one sitting around. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go out and buy one to measure material properties. Um, and they have a defined range for both the stresses that they can, or the forces they can apply, so the stresses that your material can experience, and the strain that you can, um, uh, the range of strain that can be handled, as well as strain rate. So if you're looking at a viscoelastic material, um, the material properties will be dependent on strain rate, um, and that may be limited by uh, just the, the range of outputs of the motor itself. And I'd say sort of on the most sophisticated end of instrumentation, you have things like universal testing platforms. Um, commonly, we see these from um, the manufacturer Instron. Um, and these are setups that are specifically built to perform a number of different tests to measure material properties, including uh, compression, bending, tension, puncture, et cetera. Um, so, and they're, they're typically uh, set up to be very user friendly with um, uh, designed interfaces for running these tests through the equipment. Um, but again, they're, they're constrained a little bit in that uh, they're relatively expensive. So it's a big piece of equipment um, to get for doing these tests. And they also uh, have a defined range, range of stresses, strains, and strain rates that can be used. Um, so depending on what tissue you're working with, what kind of properties you're interested in measuring, um, and some other considerations that I'll talk about, you may wanna use uh, one or other of these different approaches. And the reason why um, you might have to consider which of these types of um, instrumentation you need to use is because when we're working with biological tissues, we're deviating a little bit from sort of the ideal conditions of material testing as they've developed from material science. So if we were working um, in a lab that manufactured materials and we were interested in measuring the properties of those, we would be able to create sort of ideal testing conditions um, in order to understand uh, this material that we've manufactured. Um, so first of all, we would have a sample of uh, what is presumably a homogenous material. So we know that all throughout the sample that we create, it is the same material. So the properties are gonna be the same throughout the entire sample. And we can control the shape of the sample that we create. Uh, a typical shape you see is this dog bone shape where you have, um, uh, in this case, we're looking in two dimensions. So it's a wider shape at the ends and narrow in the middle. And the reason for doing this is by controlling the cross-sectional area, we're able to uh, choose where stress is concentrated in the sample. Um, so stress being forced uh, divided by cross-sectional area we know by making this region narrow that the highest stresses will be experienced here. So we've created sort of the functional region of the sample that we're gonna be taking the measurements from, but also created low stress regions on either end that are gonna help with attachment. So then when we apply a force, in this case, a tensile force that's stretching this sample, uh, we can measure the deformation of just the region that we're interested in. Um, we know because we've controlled the shape of the sample that we have a unidirectional application of force. Um, and we also have the ability to have large areas for clamp attachment. So it's very easy to hold on to either of these samples, either end of this sample while you're applying the forces. So under these ideal conditions where we're manufacturing a material, we have a lot of control over how force is applied and the way the material is going to deform and where we're taking our measurements from. Um, the issue is that when you're working with biological materials or, or working with soft tissues, um, often we have to violate a lot of these uh, criteria. So when you're working with tissue, 
uh, the structure that you're taking the sample from may not be a homogeneous material. So for example, we're looking here at the attachment of um, the Achilles tendon to the gastrocnemius muscle. And you can see that there is a um, continuous connection between the connective tissue of the free tendon and the aponeurosis that she's the end of the muscle. Um, and the material thus is not uh, homogeneous as you move from one end of the, the structure to the other. So you have to be careful about the choice of where you would take a sample from. It may not even be possible, depending on the tissue that you're working with, to excise a uniform sample. The structural complexity um, may be thus that you can't cut out a nice dog bone shape from your sample. Or it may be difficult to decide from, from what region you can take a sample that would be representative of the uh, material behavior of the whole structure. And um, both of those concerns mean that whatever sample you choose may have uh, regional, he regional heterogeneity in stress concentrations, and you may see heter heter <laughs> heterogeneity in strain as you're trying to test this sample. Additionally, uh, when you're looking at structures made of soft tissue in biology, um, they're often not deforming in a single direction, but may deform in multiple dimensions when they're being used in vivo. And so you're faced with the decision of um, in which orientation would you excise a specific sample and in what direction would you apply forces when you're doing this material testing um, when you're working with a complex 3D structure. And finally, um, there's all sorts of difficulties that can arise with attaching these materials. If you can't cut out a nice clean dog bone shape and get those nice wide areas for attachment, um, you could have difficulty with actually getting the sample attached to your testing rig, um, or depending on the material, it may be slippery, it may be very small. There's lots of reasons it could be difficult to actually attach the sample to your rig, and I'll talk about that in a second. So um, for a lot of biological tissues, we're violating the criteria that make ideal conditions for material testing. And so we have to figure out ways to sort of work around that and make sure that we're getting um, the best data possible. So creating the right setup when you're uh, measuring biological tissue depends on really um, the idiosyncrasies of the tissue that you're looking at itself. So what material property are you interested in measuring? That's going to define what type of instrumentation you need and potentially the way that you're going to attach your sample. Are you interested in applying a particular strain trajectory that represents the way the structure is moving in vivo or alternatively applying a specific loading regime that represents in vivo function. That's going to determine what kind of instruments you need to use. What size is the sample and what is the expected strain um, range of strains that you might see? If you're working with um, a piece of material that's 20 centimeters long and it's going to strain 100%, that's going to have big implications on what types of instrument you can attach to it, as well as the way that you can um, secure that to your instruments. Um, alternatively, if you're working with very small samples or samples that are expected to strain very little, um, you need to be using uh, instrumentation with high resolution. And generally, the smaller sample you're working with, the harder it is um, to excise um, uh, uh, homogeneous sample regions, the harder it is to create attachment to your setup. Um, and additionally, depending on what uh, tissue this is and where it's coming from in an organism, you may have to consider the morphology. Um, as I said a slide ago, these can be complex 3D structures that are straining in different directions. Um, you may have to consider um, which orientation of your sample you want, which direction you want to apply force, and potentially you can take advantage of morphology um, to create regions of attachment, which Dr. Horner will talk about in a little bit. Um, so, for example, if you were interested in measuring uh, the energy that's lost from cyclically straining a material in tension, um, you would need to consider how much strain is required and uh, what is the range of strains that are possible from whatever motor uh, setup you have, as well as what types of stresses do you expect are necessary to achieve that strain, and are you capable of applying those. And additionally, in this case, when we're looking at cyclical loading and unloading, um, you'd want to consider the rate at which that uh, cycle is being applied 
Is that something that is representative of in vivo function? Is that something that's possible uh, with the motor that you're using? Um, once you've considered um, what type of instru instrumentation you want to use, you also then have to figure out how you're going to attach it. Um, there's lots of different ways of attaching materials. Um, there can be mechanical attachment through clamping, so applying tension to either end of the sample to create that physical attachment. Um, there are various types of adhesives that can be used um, to attach the tissue sample. Um, you can similarly embed uh, one end of the structure into some sort of substrate. You can tie onto your sample using uh, different types of material. This is silk suture pictured here. A common one that's sometimes used is Kevlar thread because it's relatively inextensible. Um, there's, I've also seen setups where you uh, sew through the material using suture to create an attachment or um, puncture through using hooks in order to hold on to either end. So there's lots of different options. And in general, um, with larger samples, attachment is relatively easy. Um, with smaller samples, it becomes more difficult. And the reason for that is whatever attachment method you're using, you have to be aware of um, the potential for um, either damaging or altering the sample itself. So um, with any of these methods, you need to be concerned about slipping. So the sample just not being held firmly in whatever attachment method. But the more tightly you try to hold onto your material, the more likely it is that you're gonna create regions of high stress within the material that can lead to things like shearing or tearing. So for example, you could have tearing at the point of contact between the end of a clamp and your sample. Um, or if you're tying tightly around the end of a piece of material or tissue, um, that could create a localized stress that um, makes it more likely to fracture at that point. Um, if you're using an adhesive, depending on what your material is, that adhesive could infiltrate the structure of the tissue and actually alter its material properties. Um, so you have to be cognizant of all of these potential dangers when choosing the, the mode of attachment. Um, and often this is one of the most difficult steps of creating an experimental setup for measuring these samples. Another consideration that you have to keep in mind is the potential addition of series compliance through whatever methods of attachment and mechanical connections you have between your sample and your testing setup. So for example, here I have um, a representative tissue sample in this yellow color and it's rigidly clamped at one end and attached to a metal chain. And on the other end, it's tied with thread. And in this particular setup, when you apply a linear uh, force and tension, um, you could see not just strain of the sample itself, but also extension of um, the different materials used for attachment. In this case, we're seeing strain of the thread that was tied around one end of the sample. And the relative importance of this consideration depends on the size of your material and its potential strain range, can, strain range compared to the additional displacement that might be added by series compliance. So for example, the sample we're interested in measuring is only straining about 10% in this example, but we're seeing a 50% strain in the thread that's used for attachment. So if you were measuring this through the displacement of a motor that's applying the force at this end, um, then the displacement or the strain you're trying to see in your sample would be entirely washed out by this serious compliance added by this attachment method. In this case, you may need some other technique in order to measure the change in length of the sample itself um, and subtract out the change in length of the attachment method. Of course, if you have a much larger sample or you have a sample that is straining a greater amount, then the relative magnitude of uh, displacement caused by the serious compliance may be um, negligible compared to uh, the strain that you're seeing in your tissue. Um, so another reason why larger samples are sometimes easier in terms of attachment and measurement. Um, and when you're working with tissue, uh, there are additional factors you have to consider that are sometimes not uh, in play when looking at manufactured material. So many biological tissues need to remain hydrated in order to uh, maintain the material properties that we see in vivo. Depending on what you're working with, uh, the material properties may also depend on the temperature at which that uh, tissue is functioning. Um, and if you are 
looking at a hydrated material, particularly because um, most of these tissues we're looking at um, have a, are primarily uh, protein in nature, you might have to consider the pH of the solution. Is this um, appropriate for in vivo function of this material? So considering these additional biological factors um, in order to make sure that your tissue is still functioning as it would um, in life. So with all of these considerations, um, that makes it sound like it's, it's very difficult to make these measurements on soft tissues in biology. And I think the, the overall uh, point is that it, it can be very difficult, but mostly it has to be suited for the specific sample that you're looking at. And to demonstrate that um, in a couple slides, Dr. Horner is gonna work through an example using vertebrate tendon. And we wanted to focus on this particular example because it's a common tissue that we're interested in um, in the context of organismal movement. So we typically think of vertebrate tendon as being responsible for transferring muscle forces to bones, as in this example that I showed before for the Achilles tendon. Um, but we also know that in different vertebrate movements, um, tendons that have elastic properties are able to store energy either from muscle contraction or from movement or release energy into muscle or into movement of the body, which is the foundation for the use of uh, stored and recovered energy in different types of movements um, like cyclical energy recovery or um, the uh, addition of power to uh, burst movements or uh, attenuating power during deceler deceleratory events. And the ability of this particular tissue to function in these different roles depends on its material properties. For example, depending on its flexibility or stiffness determines whether or not it's able to store and release energy in these different ways. Transferring force depends on its tensile strength, um, so the ability to handle the forces generated by movement or muscle before, uh, before um, being injured or uh, the elasticity of the tissue being able to not just um, uh, stretch elastically but recover and release that energy again. So for all these reasons, we're, we're very interested in vertebrate tendon as a tissue and in different situations, different organisms and different movements, may, we may wanna know um, how the material properties of that tissue uh, influence the role that that tissue can play in movement. But uh, vertebrate tendon is a particularly tricky tissue to work with. Um, often these are complex 3D structures um, that are not necessarily arranged in clean linear, uh, linear patterns. Uh, we know that as a material, uh, vertebrate tendon tends to have a nonlinear stress strain relationship um, because it is a tissue that has structural complexity at multiple layers of organization. So we see um, different relationships between stress and strain defined by different levels of organization within the material, particularly a toe region um, followed by a somewhat linear region in stress strain um, before leveling off into the plastic region. Um, as I mentioned before, you could see regional heterogeneity in this tissue, depending on the structure that you're taking it from in an organism. And often uh, we're looking at uh, relatively low ranges of strain, five to 10% is actually fairly large for looking at vertebrate tendon. Um, so um, you may have relatively small displacements that you're trying to measure, especially if it's a very small sample. And additionally, um, it is a moist tissue, which means you have to consider whether it's uh, maintaining hydration during testing, but that also means it's quite slippery. Um, it's relatively hard to hold on to um, through clamping or other mechanical attachment without uh, damaging the material by creating these localized points of stress concentration. Um, but because it is uh, a hydrated tissue, it also absorbs liquid adhesives. So using that method of attachment can potentially change the properties of the sample itself by absorbing inside and then solidifying or polymerizing inside the material. Um, so it's a very interesting tissue uh, that many of us want to measure, but poses some specific challenges. I'm going to hand this over now to Dr. Horner, who's going to talk about um, some of the ways that her lab has overcome some of these challenges uh, for doing some experiments. Thank you, Jeff.
All right, that was a great segue. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so to kind of think about why tendons and ligaments are gonna be um, in some ways even harder to, to test than others, we have to keep in mind that they are viscoelastic materials. And so one of the things to consider in these experiments is the length, overall length change you're going to apply to the system as well as, as the rate at which you um, apply this tensile stress. So because viscoelastic materials have both properties of elastic materials and viscous, they're gonna be rate and history dependent, the, their material properties and performance. And a common way to depict this is using uh, a diagram like this, where we have a tensile force applied. We have an elastic spring in parallel with this dash pot here, representing the viscous force. So the elastic spring, we can think of as representing one of the primary protein components in tendon and ligaments, which is collagen. And both collagen and elastin are going to have elastic uh, material properties, although one is considerably stiffer than the other. And in those cases, length change in a purely elastic uh, element is going to be directly proportional to the force applied. But as Jeff mentioned, there are also uh, many things within tendon and ligament, such as extracellular matrix, um, fluid components that are going to display more viscous type responses to load. And in that case, we've represented this with this dash pot. And this will act as a kind of breaking mechanism to the whole system since they're in series. And in the case of a purely viscous material, it would respond, uh, the strain would, would be a function of the rate of that applied stress. So one of the typical parts of an experiment, if you're going to test the material properties of a tendon, even if you're not explicitly interested in hysteresis, you still have to apply something like a series of sinusoidal waves. If you're doing this via an ergometer, you're simply going to output um, length change to that ergometer with your uh, specimen attached, clamped in. And it will apply these series of length changes and you can dictate the amplitude and the rate of those length changes. Now, one of the ways that engineering and biology have different kind of end goals is engineering is often interested in the limits of a system. And in biology, we wanna to try to, as Jeff mentioned, bring it back to sort of the organismal ground truth of the system. What is the actual rate and amplitude that would be relevant in the animal's life in addition to measuring kind of the limits of that. So in this case, we're going to try to apply strain and um, sinusoidal rates that are um, coincident with an animal's stride frequency. And because tendon and ligaments are both viscoelastic materials and have some um, rate and history dependence, what you'll see after you apply a series of sinusoidal waves is you'll tend to see this change in amplitude and response over these hysteresis loops with each loading cycle. So it's important to get these um, performed on the tissue so you can kind of be dealing with a system that is loaded in a biologically meaningful way, um, as well as um, kind of taking into account those viscoelastic elements. Um, we also might be interested in the amount of hysteresis in the system. And that hysteresis is going to be this area under the curve from the loading region versus the unloading region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So in many experiments, and in, including this one, the objectives of that experiment are to get kind of the same features measured. We wanna measure the stiffness, which we have represented here is the modulus of that stress strain curve. We also, again, very much dictated by engineering terms, we wanna be interested in what the failure stress and failure strain are. From a biological perspective though, one of the perhaps more important things to an animal's perspective is this yield stress and the yield strain. Because even if we have a particularly high or long failure stress or strain, what matters in terms of an animal's biology is when it starts to rupture. Tendon is one of the slowest tissues to heal in a vertebrate. 
uh, slower than bone, slower than muscle. So if you do uh, damage to a tendon, it's irreversible for quite some time. And that can ultimately lead to uh, death if you're a prey animal or decreased locomotor ability if you're a person. Um, so this is, is really an important measurement as well. And we'll get that by doing something uh, we call a ramp to failure, but that ramp to failure should come after those cyclic loadings. And from those cyclic loadings, we can get these hysteresis loops. And from that, we get um, a measure of how elastic it is. We can either get that from this modulus here. It should, in theory, match this same modulus we would see from the linear region in this loading and unloading um, cycle. And we can also look at hysteresis. So the area indicated in blue is going to tell us how much energy is lost in that system. And what we see in different types of tendons from different types of animals, even different types of muscles, is that more cursorial animals will have more efficient tendons that are able to store and release elastic energy much better than tendons from other parts of the body that don't need to worry about that. For example, rat tail tendon is often used as a comparison because tail tendon um, does not need to store and release elastic energy. In order to complete this, we will, of course, have to measure cross-sectional area. I'm not going to get into the details of that in this particular example, but there are various methods to do this. When measuring soft tissue, of course, calipers are not ideal. Um, most standard calipers require that you have to touch the tissue. And for something like a mouse tendon, even a little bit of uh, touching can potentially damage it. So what we do is we use uh, captured images from lateral and, and um, dorsal views, and we measure cross-sectional area. We moderate, we uh, use a, an ellipse as our tool, and we model it as an ellipse and get cross-sectional area that way. As Dr. Saloda spent some time discussing, you also need to have a resting or reference length used. In this particular case, what uh, we found to be most helpful was to apply a standard force to our tissue when it was uh, already in the rig. And that standard force um, then is whatever length the tissue is at that standard force is our reference length. And we use the same force across all experiments. So it's um, comparable within our own study, but one of the, um, challenges of doing experiments like this, particularly when you're in a world that um, crosses fields like biomedical to comparative biology, is there are different standards and practices. So sometimes you have to um, follow somebody else's standards in order to be more comparable. There are also, you have your experimental factors that you might be interested, you might be interested in comparing um, animals that were exercised to animals that were not exercised. And then you have some factors that are going to introduce variation to your sample, whether you like it or not, but you should consider. And one of the most surprising factors is sex. So female mice, especially if they're close to um, sexual receptivity, will have different tendon properties. So uh, there's a hormone called relaxin that uh, cycles variously um, and that can change tendon and ligament properties quite a bit. Body mass, of course, should correspond in a regular way, um, and that's also sex-related as well. And another consideration is the muscle mass and the type of muscle that's in series if you're doing a tendon experiment. Um, if you're doing an experiment with an animal that has big bulky muscles, we would consider that um, to obviously have a big influence on uh, the tendon properties. So here I'm going to start to show a series of videos that we collected from an experiment we did earlier. And I'm skipping some of the parts that maybe people would like to see, which is uh, including the tying on of silk to the proximal end of this. But just for now, and all of these uh, gloved hands are Miles Valencia. He is a newly minted master's student who will be starting um, in um, Mania Zizi's lab at UCI. 
that animated entrance was my last present to Miles. And let's play this video. And so here, what we're showing is this distal end of the tissue here is um, interesting, is corresponding to the distal attachment of this particular muscle. So these are the um, medial and lateral, lateral gastroc muscles within the mouse. We have removed the soleus and plantaris. And the proximal end includes just a little bit of the medial and lateral gastroc muscles. And what we want to do, as you can see, this is a very small sample. Um, this is a regular sized mouse. What we want to do is we want to maximize the amount of free tendon that we can test. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, um, a lot of clamping uh, methods actually decrease the amount of free tendon that you have to work with. They do damage to the tissue itself. So if you don't have a big robust sample and you don't have a lot of free tendon to work with, that can be fairly problematic. And pardon me while I try to get this video to play. There we go. This technique right now is marking the tendon. We're using a little bit of India ink. You can use any indelible ink to mark the tissue directly. And the reason for this is we want to, we want to mark the tendon directly so that we can record in high-speed video and track uh, the changes in the tissue directly. This is a way to circumvent all of the effects of serious compliance that are going to be introduced by the silk suture thread that we're using to attach it to the motor. Um, any uh, imperfections in the knot, um, other tissues that are in series with this, like the aponeuroses of the gastrocnemii muscles, the gastrox themselves. There are all sorts of um, introduced compliance in these experiments, and they are very difficult to completely eliminate, particularly when you have a small tissue. And so in order to bypass that, we mark the tissue directly. Another method to increase the amount of free tissue, free tendon that we can see and use for our experiment is to use this clamping technique with this wooden block. So this is something that Miles actually just dremeled out himself. Um, we painted it white so it would show up better in the video. Um, we have also marked it with um, a, a scale bar so we know in our um, lateral view how what, what digitized length that corresponds to. Um, and the idea came from this paper from Probst et al. And again, it was really just to minimize the amount of damage done to these tissues during these experiments, mouse tendon in particular. It's a frequently used um, tissue in biomedical research, but there's not very much tendon to work with. So any clamping technique that can uh, give you all the free tendon that you could use is, is ideal. And the idea is you take the distal end of this tissue with its bony insertion to the calcaneus, um, and you kind of just stuff it in that, that little section right there, as Miles is clearly demonstrating right now. And then the wooden block itself can be clamped um, as firmly as you need and set up in the overall rig. Now there is going to be some compliance in this system still. The wooden block itself has some compliance. Um, there's a little bit of slippage as the uh, tissue is settling into that block. It's not a perfect system, but again, by marking the tissue directly, we are able to circumvent those compliance of the rig and the setup. And so what this looks like, we have recorded these videos at uh, 300 frames per second. We're playing back at 60 frames per second. And this is just a series of um, sinusoidal waves. So again, we're trying to target biologically meaningful amplitudes and rates. So this is at about two and a half hertz, I think. Um, 
one thing I'd like to, to point out is that both Jeff and I are currently at Cal State Universities, but we, we come from similar training backgrounds. We've even trained in the same labs. Right now, it might, uh, might not be a big deal to even record this at something like 2,400 frames per second on a cell phone. And meanwhile, 20 years ago, high-speed video cameras might eat up your entire startup budget at an R1. So we're in a remarkable time where we have lots of open source software options. Um, the technology is, has gotten so good that my phone actually records better video than, than my high-speed video rig from 2014. Um, if you need to have multiple views, one trick to avoid having to synchronize multiple cell phone cameras, which is very tricky to do, is to set up a mirror at a 45 degree angle capturing the other view that you're interested in. So we have the tissue doing these series of sinusoidal waves and the motor, in this case, an Aurora Scientific. Um, by the way, this image is borrowed without permission from Dr. David Saloda. The length output of the motor is whatever you programmed into it. So you programmed two and a half hertz, you programmed uh, one and a half um, amplitude, and your motor output is going to give you an accurate depiction of what you programmed it to do. When we actually digitize what's happening to the tendon itself, so we have a dot that's close to the distal end of the tissue, we can't get to the very tippy tip of it here, but we can get close and then two proximal dots, we can uh, then convert those data to, to real-time length change. And that's what the tendon itself is reporting. So we can see big differences in the amplitude, of course. And that difference in the amplitude between what we get from the digitized tendon data and what we get from the motor data is all representative of those various parts of the rig that are introducing compliance to the system. And it is huge. So much so that when we plot these hysteresis curves, we see that the motor is indicating that we have actually a very compliant system. We have uh, strain approaching 30%, whereas the tendon tissue it's, itself rarely gets to 10%, even in our ramp to failure experiment. So as a reminder of where that compliance could be coming from, the wooden mount itself has some compliance. Our attachment, the rig itself, it, it's uh, you know standard intro bio lab materials. There's nothing too fancy here. So there's going to be some compliance in just how ring stands are, are set up, et cetera. The silk suture definitely has compliance. That's actually known and published values. Um, Kevlar thread would be an effective way to reduce the compliance brought in by that, that particular material. Um, even the best knots tend to have some settling in and some imperfections. And we also, of course, have other tissues in series in an, in a, an attempt to keep as much free tendon as possible. We have included quite a bit of the proximal attachment, um, which will necessarily include the aponeuroses of those gastrocnemius muscles, as well as a bit of those tissues themselves. So after collecting a series of sinusoids, we want to get the failure stress and the failure uh, strain. And we do this in a typical procedure called a ramp to failure. And so now we're going to pull this tendon until it ruptures. And we'll see that happen in just a bit. You can see the fibers are starting to separate, so we're well into the plastic uh, portion of this curve. And now we have almost complete rupture, and even at 300 frames per second, it will um, get really blurry here in just a sec. Almost completely separated, and there, final separation. So in following our theme, so this is what the force recorded by the motor is. So from this, this actual video here, um, we reach a force of a little over 500 grams, which is pretty substantial for this, this little tissue. 
And then the, the motor is going to report a length change that, again, it's whatever we programmed into it. It's not going to be any different from that. The actual tendon is going to differ slightly. But we'll notice as we're doing this ramp to failure, this bit here is going to correspond to when we're kind of drawing up all the slack in our system. So we're pulling the slack from all of the other things that are in series in the rig. Um, and then eventually we get to a point where those lines are going to be parallel. And in ramp to failure, then we're going to be able to um, kind of draw up all the, the series compliance slack and get to sort of an approximation of the same um, modulus value from that. Um, so from these data, then we're able to get failure stress, we're able to get failure strain, and we're able to uh, correspond this all to elastic modulus. Excuse my background noise here. So some other considerations in, in doing these small animal experiments is what we need to do is, again, try to strive to use clamping methods that aren't reducing the amount of free tendon. So clamping methods that are uh, frequently done in other studies might not work for your particular study if you're trying to do something in a small animal. We also have to either consider um, eliminating the compliance in the system completely, which is not impossible, but it is difficult to do. Um, one of the techniques is to use Kevlar thread. Um, this is something that is um, fairly inelastic, especially compared to the tissue of, of your um, interest. Um, but it is very difficult to eliminate compliance in the entire system. There's always going to be a little bit. So you can either try to measure or estimate that um, or eliminate it completely. Or um, what I think is probably more reasonable to do, although more time consuming in terms of data processing, is to measure displacement directly on the tissue by marking the tissue itself. This is not as difficult as it used to be. And again, one of the things I want to stress here is that both Jeff and I are now at um, not R1 institutions, but you know, research, research intensive institutions that don't have as many resources. So we don't have a huge lab that we can you know, solder together parts from. You do have to kind of work on a shoestring budget. And if you don't want to eat your whole startup budget on something like high-speed cameras, and you're willing to work with open source software, um, cell phones from two years ago are actually going to, to do you pretty well. And then one of the issues that I think I bump into pretty frequently in my particular line of work is I often am trying to straddle biomedical research as well as comparative research. And there's a, a constant need, or I feel like, to um, emphasize the context of the data. And if we are not contextualizing the data, we are simply measuring like the engineering materials properties of a tissue, but without actually considering how the animal is using that tissue. So in the case of small animals, many times those tendons especially are actually never going to be loaded anywhere near the elastic region of that tissue. They're, they're pretty much staying in that toe region. So if we were to measure the elastic modulus of those tissues in the toe re region, that would be um, more relevant to that animal's actual locomotor load. Um, and again, this is something uh, to always consider. How, how is the animal loading the tendon? What is the typical force applied to that tendon? What, what's the animal's body mass? How much load does a single limb take um, in, a, in a given stride? And what is that animal's natural stride frequency? Uh, that concludes my example talk. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you wanted to add anything else about uh, doing, doing research at a mid-sized university. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you bringing up that point. Um, I think it was something I was uh, uh, approaching obliquely when I was talking about the different types of instrumentation that you can use to do these measurements um, and talking about what is more or less expensive, which is if you're interested in, in measuring material properties from, from tissues, 
Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go out and buy specialized equipment that is manufactured and advertised for doing that, that there are these ways to work around with what you have, um, like co-opting a muscle lever, which is typically used for, for in vitro muscle experiments for measuring material properties of a tendon. Um, and especially appreciate the point about uh, camera technology um, and sort of the ability to use what you already have on hand. Um, so yeah. Right. Yes, and famously, Bruce Jane, um, whose lab we both worked in, um, we, we were meant to treat those high-speed cameras with the utmost care. And just, they were, at that time, um, I think the whole rig had been 90 to 100,000 K. And I just remember running into Bruce at a sick bee meeting, I don't know, in uh, 2013 or something like that, and showing him my new cell phone and said, guess what? My cell phone captures all those ranges of high speed video. So that, yeah, there, there are so many things we can do using a combination of open source techniques, as well as um, cobbled together experimental tools. Um, Often if uh, your university is equal parts teaching and research, um, you can certainly try to find tools that would be equally valuable in the teaching lab as well as in research. Um, that's been one way um, that we use to get a materials testing system. Um, and certainly that also has to do with the types of questions you ask. And sometimes that is dictated not necessarily by pure scientific interest, but also what's at hand and what's available. Yeah, and I think um, another point to emphasize that I think you demonstrated admirably is that despite the difficulties and all of the, the sort of weirdness that you might encounter with a particular tissue that you're interested in, um, just applying a little ingenuity um, uh, can, can sort of help you get there with, with the experiments um, and that anybody, <laughs> any of us who are trying to perform these types of experiments are going to have all of these, um, you know, potential problems that we're going to have to solve and, and talk about and include as part of uh, sharing our research. And so um, I would say that for somebody who is interested in doing these types of experiments or making these types of measurements to not be um, daunted by the fact that, you know, there may be some, um, some parts of the process or some pieces of the experiment that are not the prettiest, um, but that's, that's the way that these go. We're solving pretty difficult problems with trying to make these measurements, so. David, did you have anything to add or? Nope, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. This will be a really valuable online resource and a starting point for people. I really appreciate all the presenters. And this workshop recording will be posted online within the next couple of days as an open access resource. Thank you all again. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. And if that's it, we are going to head out. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.